How do you see events evolving with AI and with some of the technological advances that we're seeing? What impact is that going to have on events? You can use AI to be a lot more creative. AI is not about AI. AI is about how you put things into AI that you want to express. So you're going to see better themes. You're going to see you know, better introductions. You're going to see better everything from AI. I mean, that's just one aspect because I, you know, I believe in the content side. I think it's going to drive efficiency. I think it's going to um, make Make it so that, you know, our ragtag band of a few people can do the job of 10 people as opposed to feeling stressed out. It's going to make it more interesting. Welcome to The Venue RX. On this show, we document and share best practices around owning, operating, and managing world-class wedding venues. What is up, everyone? Jonathan here with The Venue RX, and I am so excited for this episode today. This is going to be one that you're going to want to listen to all the way through. We have David Adler here with BizBash, and uh, you know, you're know you going to really hear more what BizBash is, but it is really, I would say, the number one resource for uh, meeting professionals, for event professionals, and you know, uh, if you've listened to this show for any amount of time, that I love events. I, I love uh, meetings. I love venues. I love everything to do with uh, with this industry, and that's what we're here about. So, David, thank you so much for coming on the Venue RX, and we're really excited to have you. Fantastic! Really good to be here. All right. Well, I want to go back and like I love the good origin story, and so I, I'm curious, like, what led you? Because you're the founder of BizBash. Take us, take us back. Like, how did you? Get... Well, I'll take you way back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do it. So, um. Hmm. Let's start back in college. I went to American University. I led all the demonstrations in the in the in the early seventies. So I got a little bit of event organizing going on there, and uh, and I um, ran then ran the political campaigns for all the people on student government when the student government actually meant something. And then the month after I graduated college, I started working at my father's ad agency, and 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 I really. We had these clients, these big venue clients and these big um, uh, pro- big apartment companies uh, that had like luxury apartments. And we were trying to figure out how do we sell to those people, the you know, wealthy people of Washington back in 1975. It was like the 60s were over and it was the beginning of the, the, the yuppie era, sort of the beginning of that. And so I just started a society magazine in Washington, D.C. called Washington Dossier. The month after I graduated college, I hired my mother to be the editor, and we ended up going out every single night uh, covering the Washington social scene, which was presidents and senators and ambassadors. And, and, and we basically went to events every single night. And what I discovered, that the number one skill set of, event or, of, of, of politicians was event organizing because they needed to do it for their campaigns. So we covered these events. We kept covering these events, and it was about the people side of the business. Uh, and I did it for like 14 years. Uh, people thought I was a maitre d' because I was in black tie every night. When I got home to my apartment, they wondered, why are you in black tie every night? And uh, and so I got to really understand that world. I, so I sold that company and I ended up getting headhunted to work for a big company in New York called Prime, called, called um, uh, Maxwell Communications or Macmillan, but the same company. And it was very interesting because I ended up doing all the events for the people, for the for the CEO of the company. And so I learned all about doing events. I did events on his yacht. He had um, he was the one of the biggest British um, event organizers, and he actually had a famous daughter who is power who is well known today because she's in prison named Glenn Maxwell. Oh, hey. So it was very interesting that uh, that I was involved with all that craziness then. And uh, when that company was sold, I ended up um, working for a company called Prime Media which owned 350 magazines. And I was doing events. I was doing like the 25th anniversary of New York Magazine and the 50th anniversary of Seventeen Magazine and the 100th anniversary of the Daily Racing Forum. And I would hire this guy named Robert Isabel to do all my events. And each one was a million dollars here, half a million dollars there. And I would negotiate, like if he took out one palm tree in the scene, it would I'd save $100,000. So it was like, there was no marketplace for the event industry. So after being at Prime Media for about 10 years, I realized there's something, you know, I'm doing all these events. I'm calling my friends to ask, who do you know that does X, Y, and Z? Um, the event organizers and the, and the event planners 
own their Rolodex as their secret sauce. And so what I did with the internet coming around in the night and in in about 2000, and actually earlier than that, I started a, um, a company called BizBash. And basically what we did is we would go to um, events and say, who did what at the event? And it was all public because you go to an event, you see who is the, who is the uh, florist and who was the decor guys and who was this. And those were the things that were kept secret by all the event planners. So I took them and just disintermediated the event planner at the time and would publish, here's the event and here's all the people that worked at the event. And so what happened was it became a creative source for people to say, oh, I like that idea. I can do that. And so we started doing editorial with kind of an attitude. Like it was, we were like very, not snarky, but we were like, we, we did it with a, a cachet. And people started living. We did it in New York. I did it for like five or six years in New York. And then a friend of mine said, oh, I want to do it in, in, in Florida. I want to do it in Toronto. <laughs> so I licensed them to these other markets and I helped them with the licensing program. And, you know, it was, it, it didn't really work out that well because they didn't keep the same level of quality that I left. And, uh, so at the, at 2007, during the, um, during the, um, uh, the downturn, <clears throat> I bought them all back, um, because everything was kind of falling apart in the world and just then started, you know, we started covering events. We started, we putting out a magazine after we started digitally, because it was all digital at first it was a newsletter that went out every week. That said, who did what in New York events? So people wanted to be in the club. They wanted to be the, in the, you know, they wanted to do the MTV after party and they wanted to, you know, do the wedding. That was the coolest wedding ever. They wanted to do Michael Douglas's wedding and they wanted to see who did what else. And so it was also built on a business that my father had started in Washington called Apartment Guides. Apartment Guides were a way to see what rental properties were available by the year. And so I thought, this is the way it connects to venues, I would create a directory of, instead of by the year, how do you do uh, uh, an apartment guide by the hour? So venues sell by the hour. So I started creating lists of venues, saying who did what at the venues, and we covered an editorial, and people started using that to find out where they wanted to do their next event. So we created a guide, basically. Hmm. And the guide had an editorial complexity to it that connected uh, who did what with the directory of where the event venue was. So you were able to have this circular thing to see who did what, who did the venue, who did the event, and it kept going back and forth because we would list all the events that people did. And and that way people wanted to use the vendors that were part of the biggest events in New York. And so we, we then we started, a, then we went to Javits one day and they wanted to be able to gather event organizers. So they gave us a free trade show for, three years to start our trade show business. And we did that for 25 years. And then we started, um, you know, the, the magazine uh, went from a, from a newspaper to a print magazine. And every year we added a new city. We started, we added, we added Los Angeles. We added Toronto. We added uh, Washington. We added Boston. We added uh, Miami. And so I was, my whole life was going to every one of these cities and re- duplicating the same thing and trying to make stars out of the local people in the community because there was no infrastructure there. There was no sort of like hierarchy. And so that's what I basically did. I said, I created this sort of community out of these local communities and we were able to give it the sort of the sauce that made it cool. And we'd cover the stories and we would, you know, we would give out awards. We would do um, a hall of fame events where we'd honor the people that uh, worked in a particular marketplace. But I did realize that the marketplace is very local. Mm. A local is very hard, so you have to replicate yourself. So we were we 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 did our trade shows in New York, L.A., Toronto, um, Chicago, Boston. Why we never did one in Washington, but 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 that's the way we built our brand, and it was a fantastic. And it's it's a love brand because people love the idea. Our people in our industry love to see what other people are doing. So I call it we peek over the fence to see what other people are doing because you can't get into someone else's event. So that's why I did, you know, that's what the origin story of BizBash is. And it also made me realize that event organizers can't be event organizers anymore. They have to be collaboration artists. They've got to look at the higher level of why people connect, whether you're at a wedding or whether you're at a, uh, you know, a conference or whatever. There has to be a purpose and a meaning for everything because we're in the most powerful industry in the world. And I always say we're not in the events industry anymore. We're in the goosebump business. We're in the business 
to get people to feel excited so that they connect. And then they use this word I call the most powerful word in the English language is let's. Because whenever people have a conversation, they say, let's go to lunch, let's go to dinner, let's hook up, let's start a revolution. So the idea is, the, the name of my book is called Harnessing Serendipity, which is ultimately an oxymoron, but it's not for men organizers because they're setting the table. Um, and then the, then I also worked, I ended up getting recruited to be sort of the um, greater director for the State Department and uh, when Barack Obama and Hillary were there. And I ended up sort of helping them by creating, learning about how they use soft power. Soft power is the hottest thing going now because it's the things that people didn't take seriously forever. And now all of a sudden, what they serve at an event is very important. How to connect people is very important. Moving the antiques around so people have something to talk about. You know, creating decor that promotes conversations. I mean, it's all about sort of how do you use this, this ecosystem to connect people, to create ideas. Even at weddings, for example, when you sit people at tables that don't know each other, they start these conversations and they say, let's talk about that. So I've seen numerous businesses start, numerous ideas happen, not by focusing on the bride and groom, but by focusing on who's attending and mixing these families that never necessarily talk to each other or their friends. So you have a whole, a whole it, 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 it's a storm. You know, it's the, really the perfect storm of creating collisions that may be, that change the world. Hey there, thanks so much for watching or listening. I wanted to take a moment and share about Common Sense Events. Common Sense Events is my company that professionally manages and operates venues all across the United States, and we're looking to work with a couple more venues this year. If you own a venue in Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, Texas, North Carolina, we are looking to work with you. Our company comes in and takes care of the marketing, the sales, the operations, we hire all of the employees, we manage all the employees, and primarily our agreements are based off of revenue share models. So it's a very affordable way to have your venue professionally managed. And this is especially good if you're thinking about retiring, selling your venue, but maybe you don't want to sell the land, or you're looking for another management option that you currently have in place. If you're interested in this, please reach out by email at venues at cseventservices.com, or you can also click the link in the description of this video or podcast. We'd love to hear from you and look forward to seeing if there's a way for us to serve you. So David, I mean, while you were talking, my mind is exploding with, with other questions and just, it's incredible what you've built. I mean, just it, because it's so true. And I never thought about that. Let's, let us, let us together. We're doing something together. And it, you're totally right. Families are made, revolutions are made, right? There's such powerful things happen at the apex of let's, let's do it. I love that. So the, the first question that I have for you as, as a result of, of this, you're in the early days, it really sounds like you were breaking kind of a mold. The, the event planners had their Rolodex, like you said, of favorite vendors, and you were putting that on display in a, in a public way that hadn't been done before. Did you get pushback or was it, did it feel countercultural a little bit? To what totally. They, some, of, some of the old liners hated us. Um, and we also did this really odd thing in media and in journalism. We told the truth. Uh, so we had like, we once beat up on Chelsea Piers because it was like hard to get there. And you know what? It was. Uh, because it didn't go through the traffic. And then, you know, what happens is they get, they get mad, but then they realize if you're an authority, this is what people are going to listen to. So I believe in that church and state thing, totally in journalism. And I grew up in, in that world. I had, when I did my society magazine, I had libel lawyers all the time because we went after, we didn't go after them, but we said, told the truth about what was happening in Washington. And um, I totally believe that your authority and your, your sense of integrity shows in everything that you do. And so we also went about, I went about trying to fight the kickback business. That's totally huge in our business and you know the smart event organizer didn't do that they took retainers and uh because it became one big con and a lot of people make a lot of money on that and, and it's still i mean commissions are a big deal in this business but it has to be done in a transparent way yeah so true so and i love that you said that that's just kind of a tie back around to the venue side of things you know we manage six going on nine venues now and we haven't taken one kickback and we haven't done because, and we just don't believe in it because of what exactly what you said. It creates a, a, a weird ecosystem around events that should be built on performance and excellence and some of those other things. 
And David, I want to ask before we get on to, because there's so much to unpack here, but do you feel like there were any skills that you learned along the way, whether it was in college at American or whether it was, um, you know, through those initial job opportunities that you had that you carried with you throughout every single role you have, maybe writing and just give anything general, anything that comes. Well, the one thing, the one thing I did when I was in high school, I took outward bound courses, you know, outward bound. It's these survival classes, these schools, they send you and they, and you end up like living on a, on an Island for three days alone and figuring out what to do. And you rappel down mountains and it's all this wilderness training. And it, it took my grades from C's to A's uh, because of the confidence that you got. But it also makes you realize that I, I like to use this, this line that, you know, it's good to keep the canvas wet because you never know where, if you, if you just, if it's, too, if it dries up, you just don't know where to go, but you want to be able to have the ability, ability and flexibility. So I learned at an early age that you have to be entrepreneurial and read the room and listen to the room and be very observant to see what people want to do in the middle of while you're doing it. So you can change on a dime, especially in our business. So, you know, if I was making, you know, you know, dramatic television, you don't want to do that too much because you have a script and everything. But in our world, you have to see what resonates. And so what I learned, I think I learned a lot about that. I learned a lot about talking to people and saying hello. I used to be shy, believe it or not. And, you know, going to an event and say, hi, my name is David Adler was painful. It was very hard to do. But then I got the confidence to be able to do that. And talking to people is unbelievable when you think about it. Do you... As you're going through your career and you're switching from someone who's learning to now someone who's producing something huge that people are learning from, did that ever leave you? No, I'm learning every single day. I am learning. I stay in touch with younger people. I am a big TikTok fan. I learn so much about everything on um, social media. I am AI crazy. I just created, I create videos every day on this um, nvideo.oa type platform. And, I, and I'm learning everything about the difference between um, uh, ChatGPT and Claude. And I'm trying to keep up on that because if you don't, you get stale. I uh, have this new thing. In fact, I was at, in Vegas a few weeks ago, and I was sitting with a friend of mine over my $19 hot dog. And I, she told me about this concept called that, that actually, she told me about this concept and then I changed my entire presentation. I used AI to help me do it. A concept called a perennial. Do you know what a perennial is? A perennial is someone who, who defies all of the labels like Gen X, Gen Z, millennial, boomer, like a perennial blooms every year and is curious about everything. So it doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter, you know, what, what, uh, what your label is. If you're a perennial, you're the kind of person we want to have at events because you're the one that knows how to talk to people and is curious about everything. And so I'm even working on doing a perennial festival somewhere, but like, I guess South by Southwest for that. Um, because I think that, that, you know, boomers are that, that like to hack, you know, living longer and, and Gen Z are curious about everything. And, you know, it's all the same thing, but you have to be open to it. You can't get stale. And you can't be sort of, you know, I want to go play shuffleboard. I mean, I'm, I'm getting old. I'm, I'm on social security, you know, it's kind of, and I'm excited about it. I'm really, because I'm learning every day about this whole new world. And, uh, right. and that's 2025. I want an invite. Uh, don't you think it would be, it's, it's interesting as hell. Absolutely. Uh, if people my age are do, or the ones that are perennials are doing great things. The ones that are, you know, shuffleboarding, I could care less, you know, yeah. the ones that say they're retired. I never would say I'm retired. I'm always doing something. Yeah. It's, it's almost a mindset versus a, yeah, a hundred. It's not, it's not, you know. Well, and we have so much, I mean, I'm 34. We have so much to learn from, from, and, and I think that the, the, <laughs> it, the learning is going back and forth, right? Like you said, yeah. um, that's incredible. So tell me about biz a little bit, how it evolved over the years. You know, it was, it was editorials. You said magazines. Uh, yeah, we had, we started off online only. I, I raised the money for this, actually. This is a funny fundraising story. So in 2000 and, uh, two, no, was it 1999? Uh, it was a frothy time in the world of the internet. Mm. 
And so I was uh, leaving Prime Media. My boss just was sent to another company. He just left the, the company. And I decided I really wanted to do this um, venue directory, basically. That turned into an editorial product. And I went to, I went to, um, I, I was, I ended up at Prime Media. I was in charge of the, um, the foundation. So I met all these like wealthy people. So I, um, I went to a, a bris of a friend of mine. You know what a bris is, you know, in the Jewish religion, when they do, um, they, they have this ceremony, uh, that, to, to, um, to, let's say, to, to, to do a circumcision. And they invite lots of people. So I went to this fancy person's house. And um, all the men don't like going to a brisk because it's not a good feeling. So I went to the back of the room in 1999. And someone asked me what I'm doing. I raised $4 million at back of the brisk for Bispesh. It's the best fundraising story ever. <laughs> um, and, and, it, and, it, and all these billionaires decided to join, you know, join the company and to, to invest with me. And uh, even this, uh, the guy who had the brisk himself is 25 years later, and he's, um, he's one of my good friends. And my lucky charm. And in fact, he's just started a, he's, he, he's an entrepreneur himself. Um, uh, and he, uh, he's developing products and he's got gazillions of dollars. So it's really, really kind of fun. And, and we just, we just started listening to people, but we went through, we went through the dot bomb in 2001. So the minute I ended up signing up to do the, to get money, uh, one year later, no, I'm sorry. We didn't get, yeah, we did dot bomb, and then we did 9/11. Yeah. So what I learned, what I did learn, is that the number one thing that you have to do when you're in a business is take a leadership role. So I ended up getting involved in something that put it pulled together the whole New York community, helped bring New York City back. And so we created this thing called CME, the the uh, Convention Exhibit Meeting Event Committee organization, and we did things like lit the Empire State Building in yellow so that Snapple would want to bring their business back, where we did a Harbor cruise to thank the people for keeping their businesses in New York after 9-11. And we did this um, thing where we sent, we had everyone take the, all their emails and send things to everyone around the country saying, come back to New York, we want your business. And it became an amazing organization of about 200 people. And to this day, I'm friendly with many of those people because we bonded so much bringing New York together. And during uh, the pandemic, we put, a, put together a lot of those same types of groups. And, and, and to me, it is one of the, you know, the leadership is the secret sauce. Do not sell your own thing. Sell the bigger picture. I believe I do these Jeffersonian dinner parties all the time. And we start with conversations that talk about an individual person. Then we go to we, and then we go to us. What can we do to help us? What can the what can the community do to help raise the level of the community? What you're doing with your uh, organization seems like you're doing that. I mean, how do you make it into something more important than um, bigger than yourself is really what the whole idea is. That's so beautifully said. And and that for Weva, I, I knew that before I even started it. I knew that if it was my thing, it never would fly. I don't want it to be my thing. I'm not interested. Very early on, we, we brought people in who have their own things. But my hypothesis was, as an industry, we need to come together to get the representation and the um, the resources, the community, the understanding of what each other are going through and how to up-level this together. And it's not because I'm going to be smart and I'm going to say some smart things or think of stuff. It has to be a group. It has to be collective. There's nothing better or better feeling than uh, being part of something bigger than yourself. And that's what I try to do in everything I do. I just did a conference in um, Las Vegas for BizBash, a leadership conference. We had 40 of the top event organizers in the room. And we, instead of just sort of talking to each other and make us feel good, we, we did something called a um, memorandum of understanding, which is one thing I learned to do at the State Department. And so we came up with 12 different points of what is so important about what we need to solve in the event organization and the event world. And... Um, we actually came up with a couple of new things. Like we want to start uh, approaching uh, digital health. We want to start, we think that's going to be a big thing in the event, in, in, our, in our industry that we can help solve. Like people being on their cell phones too long, you know, yeah. using cell phones and not being present at the event, that type of thing. So we're taking that on as one of our 14 things. 
you know, the idea that event organizers are now more important than ever because they know how the um, communities work that they're involved in. They're the underground railroad for many organizations. So we think that the event organizers got so much more power over the pandemic because this, the C level C suite people turned to them because they knew what their customers wanted, they knew knew what their employees wanted, and they were the ones that the most were the most visible talk, talk, talking to the C suite. So it, so we think that that that's another power point because of that soft power thing I was talking about that makes it um, more important than ever that event organizing is taken seriously. David, how do you know when you're at these events? And this kind of is a highly focused question. And for anyone listening or watching online, when you show up to these events, how do you decide how to network, how how to move around the, the group, especially if someone, hey, you kind of said you were maybe started out a little bit introverted. Yeah, well, I, I hate the word networking Yeah, because it seems so transactional. I just like, I mean, I... I Sometimes I have to put my hand, I, I talk to one person, say, hello, my name is David Adler, if I don't even know them. I, when I go into a room, I try to do that. And that when you start doing that, you, one thing leads to the next. And so networking is not necessarily, it's about in, in putting yourself in and taking, making the effort. It doesn't just happen naturally. One of the things I do as a, um, as a speaker is whenever I do a speech, I totally believe in welcoming people to come into the door of the speech. Uh, and it makes me feel more comfortable, actually. And I like to do that. One of the things I do when I see a line at one of my events, the coat check, I'll talk to everyone in the coat check line. When, so I put myself in the position to make myself a little bit uncomfortable. And then I listen to their conversations. I genuinely enjoy talking to people. Because what people say is just unbelievably interesting. And so you can't be a stick in the mud. I mean, that's networking. You have to give and you have to take. And you have to be willing. I mean, that's what I don't judge an event now by how many people attend, but how many conversations I'm curating. And, uh, and that's, that's a big thing I do. And, then I, and one of the other things I do at my events is I start off, I learned this from Scott Heffernan who did meet up. I the way I say how many people are, are, how many conversations is I say, okay, for the first 10 minutes, why don't you talk to the person next to you before, rather than listen to me? Because you're creating a thousand conversations in a period of five minutes. Uh, and, and you have to give permission. Like when I, I also say that, that I, like as a guy, like I won't even have eye contact with someone with the person sitting next to me. But if someone says, talk to the person next to you, I talk to the person next to me. So we need a little bit of a prompt to get us to do the right thing and to make these events successful. So it's not only you as the networker, but it's the network, you know, the, you know, the guy that's the organizer. Like, that's why I, I kind of like having receiving lines is most people go to an event, especially in your era, your age group, they never talk to anybody. Uh, but at least if they were beating the host, then they've they've broken the ice a little bit. So it forces you to speak to someone. Because most people, especially in today's world, there's this lack of, um, of protocol and etiquette about what you're supposed to do when you're at an event. You're not supposed to sit there with your, you know, your phone, do it, you know, look at it and, and not talking to people. Yeah, yeah. People do that all the time. And I fall into that too. I mean, and I, it's a safety. It's a safety thing. Um, um, so you drink. It's the new yeah. drink, right? Like it's clutching your drink while oh, yeah. you're yeah. your phone and you're just kind of, you know. <laughs> yeah, you're, and you're not even doing social media. I mean, you're just sort of like, you're just sort of like wimping out and trying to like, <laughs> oh my God, I'm scared to death. I don't want to talk to anybody. And, uh, and at weddings, it's the worst because, you know, you have people that don't normally go to events at all who are socially not, you know, sophisticated. And they're all of a sudden they have to start dancing and they have to start talking to people. And, you know, you have, you, some people who never go out at all, they go to weddings. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like, how do you transform them? And I think that it's one of the things that we have a responsibility to do is to, to focus on the, um, on, on the, um, what do you call it? The, um, loneliness epidemic. I mean, one of our key things that we have to do as events is to make people not feel lonely and also have events so they're not lonely. 
but make when you go to the event, you have to actually program them and do things. Like you have to do, you know, everyone talks about icebreakers being too like cringe or something like that. But when you do them right, you end up getting, you know, incredible amount of, uh, of, of sort of feel, good feelings. I mean, I do believe that Maya Angelou was right, that, you know, people never remember how you, um, what you said, they'll remember what you made them feel. And, and, and we have to, as event organizers and venue owners and all that, our job is to be, and it's called hospitality. <laughs> We've sometimes we forgot about that. Yeah. No. So David, I had, I had down here, I had a couple of things, uh, huh? that that I want to ask you specifically and I was interested when you went from you were at McMillan you were at some of these businesses that had a lot of structure state department of course tons of structure to then creating your own thing and this as it grew over the years what were, were those early exposures to the structure informative for how you created your own thing in terms of what you did and didn't want to do or did you go the opposite direction. Well, I was always like the idea guy. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, like, why don't we do this? You know? And I, like, I got into this billion dollar company and I had only been an entrepreneur before. And so all of a sudden it was like, I didn't know any of the rules. So the, they love that actually. Um, Cause I was able to come up with the ideas that we own this thing called channel one, uh, which was, you know, TV in the schools. And I came up with, why don't we honor Steven Spielberg and doing, you know, it was like things that, Using the event industry, the, my event knowledge to help sort of change the world uh, that I was in. But I also, you know, I think that it, it's, it's all about, I mean, accountants are good to be good accountants. I mean, I was there brought in to be a change maker and I do that in everything I do. And I don't mind and I don't get ego. I don't have an ego with my bad ideas either. Like, you know, as many bad ideas as I have good ideas. So, uh, so I still try to try, try to just keep going and not, and not worry about. You know, I don't, the judgments are not something I worry about too much because you're going to, you're not going to bat 40%. Yeah. Hey there, pardon the interruption. I wanted to take a moment and share with you about Weva. Weva is a professional association we started last year for venue owners and operators. It stands for Wedding and Event Venue Association, and it's the first professional association for venue owners and operators, specifically providing resources, education, and networking opportunities for venue owners and operators. Let's face it, owning a venue is very difficult. And if you own or operate a venue, or if you're considering owning or operating a venue, you need resources, networking, and a community that understands and supports you and your goals as you continue to grow your business. Weva is just that. We've built it to be a support to you as you grow your venue business, and we want you inside of our community. So if this sounds interesting to you, please click on the link in the description in this video or wherever this video is linked, and we would love to welcome you into the community. Take me to, uh, so one of the things, and you kind of already addressed it a little bit, but I want to I want to just ask the question and kind of see if there's anything you want to add to it. Because of the duration of time that you've been in the events industry, you've been through a number of economic cycles obviously huge tragedies in our country, as well as, um, you know, uh, ups in the event industry as well. So, you know, we had the dot-com bubble, obviously was great, wonderful in 1999, 1998, then 2000, 2001, obviously with 9-11. Then we get to 08, 09, with everything that was going on right there with finance and real estate, to COVID, you know? So you've really seen from an event lens, oh, the impact. And this is, something, this is like the main question I want to ask you. What impacts have you, you've been in long enough to like kind of maybe get rid of some of the noise. What pieces of wisdom would you pull out of each of those difficult times in our industry that event professionals now can hang on to as we're getting out of the ripple effects of COVID and maybe looking up, some people say there's a recession, some people say there isn't. Regardless, what things can we use to Continue digging into our businesses and be, be successful. Well, the one thing that the, the common denominator is people want to connect. That people look what happened in, during COVID. We were dying to get more together. We were listening to to we were doing uh, Zoom calls that were like you know with drinking and you know, all that stuff. Um, and then they wanted to get together uh, in real life. And uh, but people definitely want to connect. Nine eleven was there were, you know, while everything shut down. There were more events than ever because people in their neighborhood gathered. Uh, so I think that the the idea that we're social creatures is not going away. That's the one great thing about our industry 
you know, the bad thing about our industry is like we have, you know, economics killed it too. I mean, we, nobody could make a living and nobody wanted to do an event. Um, so it's, it's hard to answer that question. Um, but if, you know, we keep, you know, one of the things I've noticed about our industry is every time we get knocked down, we stand up and start again. Uh, we're a totally resilient group. But, it, but I think that what is happening is that people want authentic connections. They don't want fake connections. They don't want to like, you know, I, what worries me is a lot of times budgets are getting cut so much that there's no reason to even go to an event. Because you need, you know, now when you go to an event, you got to remember back, you, you almost killed your grandmother by going to an event. You know, so, so they have to be more purposeful, I think. And they have to be more worth your time. And then with AI, I mean, I've been, I went to some conferences that I wanted to kill myself because they would drone on and drone on and drone on. And now with AI, you can sort of contemporize everything and make everything tighter or make everything more interesting by better planning. And I think better formatting of the events, because I, I believe that we need to create digital formats for everything um, from like unconferences to weddings that are not that would, you know, you want to kill yourself at because they're so boring. You know, how do you make them? How do you, how do you act as a great event organizer or as I call a collaboration artist? Mm. Because it's all about how do you collaborate? So I think that we're driving more into that. You know, the big events are rising to the top. You know, TED events are still doing great. Um, you know, all of the C2 Montreal, the way they're focusing on events. Um, South by is still seems to be having some juice left. Uh, the, you know, there's some new events that are happening. Collision. I mean, it's the it's the it's the event organizers that are adding more spice to things, and I mean, it's not spice in the, the way you, some people think of spice. I mean, making it like you want to really go, and it's intellectually stimulating, and that you're building your social capital, you're building your intellectual capital. I was on a um, I was on a uh, you know, at the State Department, I helped raise twenty two million dollars for the eighth floor as a museum. So we had we had uh, Henry Kissinger interview Hillary Clinton on stage at the in at the State Department. So Henry says to Hillary, you know, Hillary, you're the Secretary of State. Every day you're drinking from a fire hose, and all you're doing is spending your intellectual capital. What you need to do is you need to to start uh, saving your intellectual capital and earning it by going to conferences and events and academics and studying, so that you can afford when you're drinking from the fire hose to actually spend the capital. And so I believe events, it changed my whole view of events. It's, 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 it's investing in yourself. And so people need to go for the right reasons and people need to actually uh, be programmed correctly. I have a big problem with sponsored content at events that sometimes you're going to an event and it's all the sponsors that are giving you the, the, the curriculum. So I think that there has to be more thoughtfulness and more um, credibility and in the content that's given out at conferences, at events, and everything. When you say thoughtfulness, do you mean the opportunities to connect with other event participants? Like, well, say that again. To, when I, say the beginning of your question. When you when say you, thoughtfulness, do you mean thoughtfulness? Yeah. Do you mean the way to to have natural, meaningful connections? Like, I'm going to bump into you. David, and, and we're going to strike up a conversation versus being poured through a, you know, loudspeaker in a sense, visually as well as auditorially from all the sponsors. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, exactly. I mean, the, I mean, the sponsors could have great content, but they may have to, they need to know how to program the room properly. Mm. They need to know, I think that people are craving intimacy. So how, and our job as event organizers is to scale intimacy, to make people feel that they're they're, they're, they're part of a thing bigger than their cell, themselves that they make. If you make one friend at an event, that's the best ROI you can ever get. You know, if you meet one person, if you have one conversation, if you get one set of goosebumps, you know, or if you see something that's inspiring, that makes you say, I'm going to change my life because I just learned about this. I mean, that's what we have to offer as event organizers and venues are the place that, that those things happen. I mean, we, we don't take it as seriously as we should. Um, it's really important to, to um, respect the fact that these are towers of learning. These are towers of connections. These are towers of networking. This is where people mix 
And, and we need to respect that and we need to also do it right. Scaled intimacy, like you said, sounds... Scale, scaling intimacy. How do you mean scale intimacy? Yep. It sounds like uh, harnessing uh, serendipity. Serendipity, yeah. It, it, it's very... It, it's, it sounds difficult. It's a, it is, but as event organizers, that's our job. We have to make people... What's hospitality? When you're... What, I, what also one of my big pet peeves is CEOs are terrible hosts. They think it's about them. It's about their guests. I feel like Seinfeld. But... <laughs> It's so true. David, when, when you were talking about the sponsors and things like that, it made me realize, you know, when, when you go to an event, a lot of times I think we, and I've been guilty of this in the past, you go to an event with a goal in mind. I want to meet X, Y, and Z, or I want to, you know, whatever. Maybe it's just my friend asked me to go and I want to try the food, right? <laughs> and so you go with this selfish intention, but you really, if you went unselfishly, you would receive much more than you ever would have been able to receive if you would have gone just trying to take. Yeah. I mean, when about this whole thing about you never know when you're going to fall in love, right? Yeah. I mean, it's it, it, where do you think those relationships get kindled? Yeah. You know, so you mentioned AI, you mentioned, you know, you're, you're a perennial, right? And may we all be perennials. I love that. I love that perspective. Yeah. Yeah. As, as you look at the future of events, connections, obviously they're, um, with content, AI is drastically changing that that market. How do you see events evolving with AI and with some of the technological advances that we're seeing? What impact is that going to have on events? Um, I think it's going to allow us to be more creative in events. Um, for example, I'll give you something I just did recently. Uh, and it, 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 it is actually about learning too. So I'm a complete political nerd, right? I um, actually had a a State of the Union watching party, okay. which not too many people. I'm live, I moved back to Washington after 35 years in New York, and I have all these people in my building who are all former, you know, big shots. And so I said, okay, what can we do to make a difference? So I I decided, okay, what would we do watching the State of the Union? I ended up researching all of the the junk food of all the presidents, wrote an article about it, and then I served the junk food of presidents at the event. So you learn about, so you can use AI to be a lot more creative. So I served jelly beans for Reagan. I served, um, uh, I served, um, you know, peanuts for Carter and, and uh, clam chowder for the Kennedys. And so you basically are teaching people the personalities of these people to get them to sort of be bigger than themselves. So I think what's going to happen is going to open up our minds to do different things because AI is not about AI. AI is about how you put things into AI that come that that you want to express. So you're going to see better themes. You're going to see you know better introductions. You're going to see better everything from from AI. I mean that's just one aspect because I you know I believe in the content side. I think it's going to drive efficiency. I think it's going to um, make it so that you know our ragtag band of a few people can do the job of 10 people as opposed to feeling stressed out and having to, um, it may not help, um, pack, um, pack like, um, uh, swag bags. Uh, but, uh, but I think it's gonna, it's gonna make it more interesting. I think, I mean, I don't know if that's a good example of it, but it's what I said, but I think that it's, you know, the creative people are going to rise to the top because all of the fundamentals logistics are going to be easier. Mm. I love it. I love it. David, there's no way that we can cover everything that your experience, you know, the breadth of your experience, obviously on this, you know, whatever, 45 minutes, hour that we have together today. Um, but I wanted, I wanted to ask a question that I think will be meaningful for folks who are listening or watching. You poured so much into BizBash, into event professionals, into meeting planners, into, you know, you've, you've been pouring into this industry. How do you stay creative? How do you stay fresh? How do I stay fresh? You know, it's uh, lately I've been as I've been on, on chat GPT a lot, asking them things that I would never have thought about. And so it's just sort of an easy way to get all the research done that, um, that, that I would never even thought about doing. For example, what I do is I keep next to my bed, my iPhone and, and I have the chat GPT $20 a month subscription and every every night I, I every night I I get up at, usually a lot of times I get up in the middle of the night 
and I say, okay, I have this idea. And I work out the whole idea in five minutes while, uh, you know, instead of like taking a note, oh, let's do this. I say, create a business plan for a rooftop party at blah, 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 using blah, blah, blah. And then I'll have a conversation with her for 20 minutes. Then I'll fall back asleep. But I also can keep track of it. Uh, you know, I just did something. You know, I need a cake. Ethel Kennedy is just turned 96. And, uh, and so I said, let me create a cake for Ethel that I can send to her. And, the, and this is what she's like. And, this is, and I was able to create the cake for her and then send it to my friend who's her, his, her daughter. Um, you know, it's like I have a, another idea that I'm working on to create um, – a uh, at, at trade shows, I want to do a musical chairs thing at a trade show, at a trade show, so that every chair represents like like let's say we take it. I was I'm pitching it to Dallas, for example. Every chair will be a different hotel in Dallas, and each hotel will end up creating their own chair as a piece of art. And and in the middle of the trade show or at wedding or anything else, you do musical chairs. You just do these old things. And I got that from I have these things I used to do called planathons, where I bring hundred event planners together and I have them create events. And so I do a lot of that. I read a lot of stuff. I talk to a lot of people. I do a lot of podcasts. I'm learning everything about technology I can learn. And I just, and I listen to TikTok. I mean, I learn so much because there are more creators and more creative people now than ever. And I think that TikTok is one of the greatest inventions. Oh, Reels, TikTok, I'm just saying that generically. Yeah. If these content creators are just, I mean, I had a knee surgery. I learned more about my knee. I learned more about, you know, like you just learn through this serendipity effect. And and I think that you got to be open to it and you have to what, read the newspaper. I actually, when I read the newspaper, I don't, I read it online, but I get the print version online so I can see where the editors decided where they want to place the stories. So I do that because it's interesting. I don't want to just read things um, uh, down and not know what the context is. So I'm doing that. Um, I travel a lot. I, you know, I travel. I try to, I just try to ask questions to meet people. Yeah. And I, and I also have a lot of conversations with people that like the, 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 the I'm, I've got really be, to be friendly with a maintenance guy at my gym who normally nobody would talk to. And I become his like best friend. And so I think that that's the kind of thing that you got to be open to do. It's like, Go below your, st your station or whatever it is, and just don't be afraid. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I love it. What's what's next? Well, I am heavily into your venue world. I am working with, um, you know, I, I sold Bizbash, uh, but I'm still there as the chairman of it and the pre and the and the founder. But I don't have as much to do because I don't have to worry about you know any of the little stuff about it. But I'm I'm working with a friend of mine uh, for a new software company called Showsoft which is a free venue management software that we make our money based on transactions. And it's a SaaS model. So we're looking for people to help us beta test it. So if anybody wants to beta test a thing uh, to help your uh, event space, it does everything from um, helping uh, pay. Uh, people can set up exhibitions on it. People can buy ticketing on it. It, it does almost everything that a good venue management software would do, but it's SaaS. So we've been able to spend a gazillion dollars on creating these in incredible interactions. And it's kind of like uh, Salesforce for, uh, for, for sales. Uh, this is for venue management. And it's, the idea is that we want to make it so that any space in America can become a venue. And we're going to provide the fuel and we're going to provide the technology to turn your business, uh, your, your sort of empty venue into a business. You know, even if it's your basement, that type of thing, if it's big enough, I guess. So it's definitely an interesting thing. I'm working with um, uh, friends in the West Coast on that. It's called Showsoft, S-H-O-S-O-F-T, and it's a platform for event spaces. I'm doing that. I'm also working on a uh, concept called Living Room Labs, which is a uh, using the it's, we're trying to reinvent hybrid events. And so you have a, a space where you have a thousand people on the screen and a couple hundred people in the room. And we're trying to reinvent how that works. And we're using kind of the way Tony Robbins does it. Mm. Uh, and we're trying to miniaturize it so it can go in 5,000 square foot segments. And it could be in convention centers, academic halls, 
um, other venues all around the world. And it it's operates like a Tesla, for example. So the software, the hardware is inside. We change the software all the time. So it's a whole new way of, of connecting with people in a way that, um, that, so I'm, I'm really, so I'm really fascinated with, with how venues work and how venues can be taken to the next level. Mm. That's my, that's my latest thing. And I'm also in the movie business. Um, my father was a novelist and uh, he's passed away. And my brother, John and Michael are busy uh, taking all of his stuff and converting them into films and movies and things, movies, I guess, and plays. And he wrote a book called The War of the Roses, which was a movie from 1989. And last week it was just um, announced that, uh, that um, uh, it's going to be made remade with Benedict Cumberbatch and Olivia Coleman. And it's a huge deal. And we got another 50 novels that we're trying to sell. His name is Warren Adler, warrenadler.com. So, um, so it, I'm doing a million things. I love it. That's amazing. That is so, that is so cool. David, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I know you've got a million things, like you just said, and I really appreciate you taking, taking the time out today. If people, obviously you gave them Showsoft, is it Showsoft.com? Showsoft.com. Okay, perfect. So yeah, show, Showsoft.com. And we can put links to all this in the description below and, and everywhere that it's going to go, okay. uh, as well as for our email list. But I'm wondering if there's a place that people... They want to connect with you, maybe about speaking or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they can reach me still at uh, dadler at bizbash.com. Awesome. And so I use D-A-D-L-E-R. 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 At bizbash.com. And I get all my emails through that. Amazing. Amazing. Awesome. David, thank you so much for coming on the Venue RX This was great. Thank you. Hey, friends, Jonathan here, and I wanted to share about Common Sense Events Consulting Packages. If you are a venue owner and you're struggling with your marketing, your sales, your operations, or maybe there's just, you know, you're new to the industry and you want to really have a leg up and get a jump start on getting your business going and not make a lot of the mistakes that oftentimes people make, the mistakes that we made, frankly, when we first started, we would love to chat with you and see if there's a way that we can serve you. Our team has experience working with over 10 venues all across the United States, doing consulting. We've hosted hundreds and hundreds of weddings at this point and we know what it takes to be successful if this sounds interesting to you we would love to chat with you you can either reach out by filling out the link in the description of the video or podcast or you can just email us at venues at cseventservices.com and we would love to chat with you and see if there's a way that we can serve you all right back to the show